I'm just going to read about William Sadler to you. Now, I got this page from Wikipedia, but I think you should know who is actually behind the Urantia book. So I will read it out for the most part, and I'll just put in commentary where I think it should be noted or commented on. Now, William Samuel Sadler, June 24th, 1875 to April 26th, 1969, was an American surgeon, self-trained psychiatrist and author who helped publish the Urantia book. The book is said to have resulted from Sadler's relationship with a man through whom he believed celestial beings spoke at night. It drew a following of people who studied its teachings. A native of Indiana, Sadler moved to Michigan as a teenager to work at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. He was reportedly 14 or 15 at the time. There he met the health the phys physician and health food promoter John Harvey Kellogg, co-inventor of Corn Flakes breakfast cereal, who became his mentor. Sadler married Kellogg's niece, Lena Celestia Kellogg, in 1897. He worked for several Christian organisations and attended medical school graduating in 1906. Sadler practiced medicine in Chicago with his wife, who was also a physician, though at the time I believe she was a nurse when they got married. He joined several medical organizations and taught at the McCormick Theological Seminary. Although he was a committed member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for almost 20 years, he left the denomination after it disfellowshipped his wife's uncle in 1907. Sadler and his wife became speakers on the Chautauqua Adult Education Circuit in 1907 and he became a highly paid, popular orator. He eventually wrote over 40 books on a variety of medical and spiritual topics, advocating a holistic approach to health. Sadler extolled the virtue of prayer and religion, but was skeptical of mediums, assisting debunker Howard Thurston and embrace the scientific consensus on evolution. Uh, evolution was still in its infancy days. But nevertheless, we'll continue on. Interesting. In 1910, Sadler went to Europe and studied psychiatry for a year under Sigmund Freud. Sometime between 1906 and 1911, Sadler attempted to treat a patient with an unusual sleep condition. While the patient was sleeping, he spoke to Sadler and claimed to be an extraterrestrial. Sadler spent years observing the sleeping man in an effort to explain the phenomenon and eventually decided the man had no mental illness and his words were genuine. The man's identity was never publicised but speculation has focused on Sadler's brother-in-law, Wilfred Kellogg. Over the course of several years, Sadler and his assistants visited the man while he slept, conversing with him about spirituality, history and cosmology, and asking him questions. 
Uh, continue. A large uh, number of interested people met at Sadler's home to discuss the man's responses and to suggest additional questions. The man's words were eventually published in the Urantia book and the Urantia Foundation was created to assist Sadler in spreading the book's message. It is not known who wrote and edited the book, but several commentators have speculated that Sadler played a guiding role in its publication. Although it never became the basis of an organised religion, the book attracted followers who devoted themselves to study and the movement continued after Sadler's death. You know, we, we watched our TV shows about America in the late 1800s, early 1900s and such, and we get the stereotypes of tra- travelling wagon man selling magic potions out of out of a wagon at carnivals and stuff like that. So far, it seems to me that Sadler possibly had some involvement with what you would call new thought occult type things, but they were not organised to the level that he could learn from. So, it's just, I've got also a, just got a tinge of sociopath about this guy. Sadler was born on 24th of June 1875 in Spencer, Indiana, to Samuel Kevin Sadler and Sarah Isabel Wilson. Now, he, the father did not allow William Sadler to enroll in public schools. Despite his lack of formal education, Sadler read many books about history as a child and became a public speaker at a young age. Samuel was a convert to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and William was baptised in the denomination in 1888 and became devoutly religious. Whether this was a normal thing to be occurring at the time, I don't know. In 1889, William Sadler moved to Battle Creek, Michigan to work at the Battle Creek Sanitarium where he served as a bellhop and helped in the kitchen, basically a gopher. He also attended Battle Creek College for one year when he was 16. Both institutions had strong ties to his church. As Sadler was mentored by local Adventist businessman John Harvey Kellogg, who heavily influenced Sadler's views. Sadler's early writings about health are similar to the ideas advanced by John Kellogg, including the concept of auto intoxication and the idea that caffeine has negative health effects. He similarly condemned the consumption of tobacco, meat and alcohol, although Sadler did drink later in life. You know, thinking about that time period, you know, let's say 1900s, uh, 1910, between it, we, what is it really actually talked about is how they're in like Europe and America, other places as well, Indians, not, but you know, 
the Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and Hinduism, which actually plays a part in this new thought type religious period. And the only other person who's famous that I know of who opposed tobacco, meat and alcohol was Adolf Hitler. Whether he had a similar period you know, where all these avant-garde type metaphysical occult things were happening, possibly. But he's a different issue altogether. Sutler graduated from Battle Creek College in 1894 and subsequently worked for John Kellogg's brother, William K. Kellogg, as a health food salesman. Sutler, a skilled salesman, persuaded William Kellogg to market his products through demonstration in retail stores. In 1894, he oversaw the establishment of Lifeboat Mission, a mission that Kellogg founded on State Street in Chicago. Sadler operated the mission and published Lifeboat Magazine. Its sales were intended to provide funds for Kellogg's Chicago medical mission. Sadler also contributed articles to other Adventist publications, including the Review and Herald. Around 1895, Sadler attended Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois, where he trained to be an evangelist, ultimately becoming an ordained minister in 1901. So, I'm starting to see a self-promoter guy. Uh, you go on YouTube and there are plenty of people who do all sorts of things for publicity. Sociopath. Uh, let's say it is such as just say sociopathic tendencies. He... Probably just wanted to build a comfort zone, so to speak. In 1897, Sadler married John Kellogg's niece, Lena Celestia Kellogg, a nurse whom he had met four years previously. Their first child, William, called Willis, born in 1899, died. 10 months later. Their second child, William S. Sadler Jr., was born in 1907. The couple had been interested in medicine for several years, but the loss of their child inspired them to pursue medical careers. In 1901, they moved to San Francisco to attend medical school at Cooper Medical College. In San Francisco, he served as the superintendent of young people's work for the Church's California Conference and the president of a local medical missionary society. The couple also operated a home for Christian medical students. In 1904, they returned to the Midwest where they attended medical school, each earning a Doctor of Medicine degree two years later. Sadler was an early adopter of Freudian psychoanalysis and believed that experiences individuals have as infants play a key role in their minds as adults, although he did not accept many of Freud's ideas about sexuality or religion. 
I think we're, but because of the of this time period, people probably shared ideas in common or believed a type of group think. This is what I'm saying here. But as William Sellers' first child died and he couldn't do anything to prevent that, even though he had trained himself in medical uh, procedures or practices, that's probably hit him pretty hard. So he, I don't know, I suppose for anyone it would be a bad thing, but if he's got sociopathic tendencies, that that's like being hit, hit in the head with a hammer. It's very hard to recover. Although Sadler was a committed adventist for much of his early life, he stayed less involved after John Kellogg was excommunicated in 1907 in the wake of a conflict with Ellen G. White, the church's founder. The Sadlers became disenchanted with the church and subsequently criticised it. Sadler rejected some Adventist teachings, such as White's status as a prophetess and the importance of Saturday as Sabbath. He retained a positive view of White and rejected allegations that she was a charlatan. You know, just through what I've read so far, I've seen contradictory opinions being held simultaneously. The only uh, other person I come across who has the sort of matter of you know uh, I agree with anything you know I want to be popular is likes of Ariana Grande Katy Perry and interestingly enough Katy Perry does say she believes in God but it's not as we know it, it's kind of like a pantheist type setup, or pantheist plus deist. This is what I've seen with this guy. You know, in Australia, the common phrase we have for someone who's not religious is are you Catholic, are you Protestant, are you Muslim, whatever, so no, I believe in God and that's about it. And I think this is what we're dealing with here. So, by 1912, Sadler and his wife, both doctors by then, operated a joint practice in Chicago that catered to children's and women's health issues. Yeah, his wife took a special interest in uh, maternal health issues. Sadler initially focused on surgery, performing surgeries with his wife, but widened his practice to include psychiatric counselling in 1930. Key date, key, key year, decade and became a consulting psychiatrist at Columbus Hospital. As a psychiatrist, Sadler advocated an eclectic mix of techniques, applying the theories of Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, Alfred Adler, and Adolf Meyer. Sadler believed that religious faith was beneficial to mental health, and specifically promoted prayer which he believed to be most effective in the context of Christian faith. However, he thought that religious beliefs were deleterious to mental health if based on fear. You know, 
if you want to know where the Kumbaya New Age hippie movement came from, this is this is a forerunner. Sadler and his wife moved into an Art Nouveau style house, the first steel frame residence in Chicago on Diversity Parkway in 1912. The couple operated their medical practice in the building. He was a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and of medical associations including the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Pathological Society and the American College of Surgeons. Sadler also a member of the faculty of McCormick Theological Seminary and taught pastoral psychology. He argued <coughs> that pastors should be educated in basic psychiatry so they could recognize symptoms of mental illness in congregants. His students later recalled him as an engaging and humorous public speaker. <sighs> we have seen religious beliefs put into a psychological context then applied as a psychological context. So this I would expect from some sort of pantheist or possibly days or a mixture of both. I think this guy was making up his religious beliefs as he went along. He did not necessarily believe that God is a personality. It's just God is everywhere but nowhere. And when you look at the 1930s, you had the likes of the Frankfurt School, uh, the Order Templus Orientalis. You had these, I suppose you could say, occult, metaphysical, existential, philosophical type groupings or beliefs. And, you know, this guy, Sadler, he's, like I said, I believe probably has some sort of sociopathic tendencies, but it, probably because of his background and his circumstance. He, the Katy Perry, wants to be popular and will say, anything to be popular but will also remain vague until he is in a position to impose that on others. <clears throat> Sadler wrote about many topics. In 1909 he published his first book, an evangelical work titled Self-Winning Text or Bible Helps for Personal Work. In the 1910s, he regularly worked all night on his writing projects. In addition to the 42 books, most of which were about personal health issues, he wrote a magazine. He wrote articles. Many of Sutherland's books focused on popular self-help topics. Historian Jonathan Spiro deems Sadler's The Elements <coughs> of Pep a quintessential book of the 1920s. In 1936, Sadler published Theory and the Practice of Psychiatry, a 1,200-page work in which he attempted to provide a comprehensive outline of psychiatry. 
And remember, this guy was self-taught. You know, he never had any university qualifications. Now you can contrast that to today, where people have dozens of qualifications and they're basically worthless and they're good for nothing. Sadler also wrote about race. He had an interest in eugenics, likely owing to Kellogg's interest in the concept, and Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race. Sadler wrote several works about eugenics, endorsing heavily borrowing from Grant's views, which posited that the Nordic race was superior to others. In his writing, Sadler contended that some races were at a lower stage of evolution, closer to Neanderthals than were other races, and were consequently less civilised and more aggressive. Sadler argued that alcoholism and feeble-mindedness, insanity and delinquency were hereditary traits and those who possessed them were breeding at a much faster rate than superior human beings. True. He feared that this issue could threaten the, the civilization we bequeath our descendants. He also believed that the majority of criminals were mentally ill. You know, in some of the criminals or people called criminals, some of them are there because of circumstance, um, poverty. Now, I believe some people will, will steal and stuff like that to get themselves out of a bad circumstance. But there are some people who are dedicated to be professional career criminals. And in this respect, you know, what he's saying is correct. In 1907, Sadler began giving lectures on the Chortal Aquel adult education circuit, which featured itinerant speakers discussing self-help and morality. And we get this today. Uh, community colleges in you know, a new age type setups, shops come and listen to Guru Swami whatever Sadler often spoke about attaining physical and mental health without drugs and from that statement alone I've Starting to see where Scientology got its basis from. Though Scientology is against psychiatry, whereas Sadler seems to be all in favour of it. He also promoted hydrotherapy and discussed moral issues that related to men. Sadler, his wife, her sister, and a friend formed a four member lecture company that gave two or three-day engagements, sometimes accompanied by an orchestra. Uh, newspapers published favourable reviews of the productions. The lectures proved to be a lucrative endeavour. It was rumoured that he became one of the best-paid Chantal Aqua speakers. Sadler believed that mediums were the source of false comfort. comfort. And after World War I ended, fought against the increased popularity of communication with the dead. In the 1910s and 1920s, attempting to expose perverted clairvoyance became one of Sadler's favourite pastimes. He regularly worked with a Northwestern University psychologist and Howard Thurston. 
instead a prominent magician while investigating psychics. Sadler may have met the magician Harry Hugh Daney, who was a skeptic around this time. So I'm trying to get into his mindset. But no, this was someone who I would say came from average circumstances for the time and went up market and wanted to protect that which he had but also wanted popularity again like Katy Perry now we get on to the Urantia Urantia Revel Revelation so according to the origin of the Urantia book Sometime between 1906 and 1911, a woman consulted Sadler about her husband's deep sleeping, prompting Sadler to observe him while he slept. He noticed that the sleeping man made unusual movements. The man then purportedly spoke to Sadler in an unusual voice and claimed to be a visitor from another planet. Observers related that the man later claimed to carry messages from several celestial beings. You know, we say this these days, you know, people pay money to have all these weird shuttlers. And more than likely, this is where it's come from. Sadler suspected that the man's words were drawn from his mind and sought a scientific explanation for the phenomenon. Although he claimed he examined the man for psychiatric problems, he was unable to make a satisfactory diagnosis. Sadler and five others subsequently visited the man on a regular basis, speaking with him as he slept. In 1925, a large handwritten document was discovered in the patient's house. Papers were said to appear in the house for years afterwards. Sadler brought the papers to his house and did not allow anyone to take them away. Although some were allowed to read them on site, Sadler presumed that the documents were the product of automatic handwriting from the man's subconscious, but changed his mind after further analysis. He made no public statements about their authenticity for years. When you look at the likes of the Urantia book, and you can compare it to Oaspe, which preceded the Urantia book, you have the issue of automatic writing or in the OASPA case apparently it was automatic typing. But just from what I've said in the past couple of paragraphs, I'm starting to suspect Fraud. I think this guy, he's doing well. He's a surgeon, he's a psychiatrist. He's on a high, but he wants something to be accepted. Uh, original, although it really wasn't. In 1924, Sadler began hosting Sunday tea gatherings at his home, which could accommodate 50 guests. Many attendees worked in the medical establishment and typically adhered to a progressive ideology. I've seen that, uh, 
a, a parcel from the Russian Revolution, Marxism was carried in, Trotskyism, um, Frankfurt School, I'm starting to say all these things coming into it. The group often held a forum to discuss the patient with the sleep issue and devised questions for him. The observers withheld the, na the man's name from the group but relayed some of his statements, again of suspecting fraud. In 1925, the forum, which then had 30 members, closed their meetings to visitors and began to require a pledge of secrecy. This is much in the way as um, secret societies kick off. Sadler instructed forum members not to publicise what they had learned, telling them that they had an incomplete picture of what was occurring. Uh, I think we said it be completed now. He also feared that the patient would face criticism if his identity were known. His, identi his identity was has never been confirmed. Jocelyn Godwin of Colgate University and skeptic Martin Gardner posit that the sleeping man was Wilfred Kellogg, the husband of Lena's sister Anna. So, if you want to look at, you know, secret societies now, um, elites and progressive, I think we are see the base of them. In 1935, Selden concluded that the papers found in a sleeping patient's house were not a hoax, citing their genuineness and insight, and arguing that the sleeping man was not a medium for the dead, but was used by living beings to communicate. He had to say that it wasn't a medium. Because if this person was a medium and if people questioned you know, these papers and wanted proof, then no proof could be answered, could be given if this was just a fraud, which it increasingly looks like. Papers ceased appearing in the sleepy man's house in the 1930s. Sadler then took a clear role as leader of the discussion group. The forum discontinued their discussion meetings in 1942, and the Urantia book was published in 1955. It purportedly contained information from the celestial beings who had spoken through the sleeping man. The Urantia book presents itself as the fifth epochal revelation God has given to humanity and states that its purpose is to help humanity evolve to a higher form of life. Again, look at today, you know, you've got what you call white, rich, progressives. They pretty much run on a similar basis to this. Whether it's a type of Marxism or Trotskyism, you know, this was meant to go international. It has four sections. The first section covers the nature of God in the universe. The second describes the portions of the universe nearest to Earth and Lucifer's rebellion. The third details the history of Earth and human religions. 
I'll just add in here that your ancient book adherents believe that the religions we follow are actually some sort of psychology or so. No, yeah, it's they're saying we're not. And the fourth provides an account of Jesus's life and accompanying doctrines. South maintained that the teachings of the books were essentially Christian and entirely harmonious with known scientific facts. Although Sadler had left the Adventist Church by the time the Eurasian book was published, its teachings are broadly consistent with some aspects of Adventist theology such as soul sleep and annihilationism. Journalist Brooke Wilensky Lanford argues in her 2011 profile of the Eurasian movement that Sadler's departure from the Adventist Church gave him the desire to build a new religious movement, citing the emphasis that Sadler placed on discussion of the Garden of Eden, the Eurasian book as and evidence of his desire to start anew. Sadler hoped that the content of the revelation would convince people of its worth and did not attempt to win supporters by emphasising its author. Walensky Lanford argues that Sadler attempted to avoid placing an individual at the centre of his beliefs owing to his disappointment in Ellen White. However, Gardner believes that Sala placed faith in Wilfred Kellogg as he had in White. This is... This is really starting to look like champagne Marxism. So this guy comes from average beginnings, becomes a surgeon, psychiatrist, and comes out with a book which cannot be verified, uh, writings which cannot be verified. It, it, this is basically champagne Marxism or socialism, or whatever, progressivism. Uh, he, this guy's coming across as an Al Gore top figure. Until her death in 1939, Sadler's wife, Lena, was a regular forum participant. One member subsequently objected to Sadler's leadership, arguing he had become hungry for power after his wife's death. In the early 1950s, the Urantia Foundation was re re established to publish the Urantia book. Hubert Wilkins, a friend of Sadler, who had taken a keen interest in the book, contributed the initial funding for publication costs. Rather than create an organised religion, the Foundation's leadership opted for what they called slow growth. Yeah, slow growth. So I'm starting to see Fabianism in this now. And when you look at it, it is about infiltrating other religions, but adhering to the Eurasian book above all. Early adherents sought to educate people about the book's teachings rather than found a church-like organisation. Sadler also disavowed proselytising and publicity. He also wrote several books about the content of the Urantia book. In 1958, Sadler published a defence of the book, citing his experience in exposing frauds and maintaining that the book 
was free of contradictions. Since his step, several Reading groups, seminars and churches have been established to study the book and to spread its message. Uh, I don't believe that's true. You might have Reading groups, might occasionally offer seminars, but churches, no. Those who adhere to the Urantia book seek to infiltrate churches in order to spread the message. But make churches, create churches, no. The authorship of the Urantia papers is disputed. Journalist Brad Gooch argues in his 2002 profile of the Urantia movement that Seller was author of the Urantia book citing similarities between some of its passages and the contents of Sadler's earlier writings. Gardner, Gardner believes that Sadler wrote part of the papers, but heavily edited and revised most of it. He also contends that Sadler refused to include some material provided to him for inclusion in the book and that he plagiarised from other works. Ken Glazio, a supporter of the Urantia Foundation, contends that statistical evidence of the text and Sadler's other works indicate he, he did not write or extensively edit the Urantia book. Myself, from what I've read of the Urantia book, I'm saying various things. Uh, Rosicrucianism, uh, probably Kabbalah to an extent. I've seen, you know, New Four uh, era type writings. So, yes, I, I believe that. For the most part, the Eurasian book has been man-made. And with the people who were invited to these tea party um, meetings or whatever, you're looking at very rich, very elitist. And 1930s, you know, socialism was all the rage or was certainly an undercurrent in society and if Sadler had sociopathic tendencies yes you know I, I can see him writing all this up though he may boast about fraudulent mediums and how he exposed them and whatever. Myself, I think in his attempt to discredit what was, what you could say, occult of the time, which he never really did, he's got involved in this. If he was a psychiatrist, he would have had access to mental patients, people who would have been deemed hopeless. And it's a possibility that he was using them as puppets for the likes of demons. Yes, that, that is actually quite feasible. Do I think he got it over his head? I would say yes, he he probably thought he ran the show, he thought he was the greatest person on earth. Again, I'm um, saying celebrities like you see today, they think they're infallible. But I also note that his wife died in 1939 and thinks kind of went off boarding. You know, 
whatever tendencies he had uh, to be megalomaniac, grandiose, his wife, in a way, balanced him out. But when she died, he lost that balance. And that may explain why he was uh, a health nut before his wife died and afterwards he took up drinking and things of that nature. With you know, William and Lena, I'm seeing the likes of Bill and Hillary Clinton. I've seen the likes of Malcolm and Lucy Turnbull. If one dies, the other one will go out of balance. This is what I've seen from this. Uh, probably a minimal approach with the actual occult, but he could not explain what it was, you know, you know, how is this possible that if I do certain rituals and that this already has happened, it must be in my mind, so to speak. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, at Al Gore, that's like, look, Al Gore could die tomorrow. But people are still going to be talking about global warming or whatever it's called these days because of what he did. And Sadler, he's died. And the Urantia book comes back to him. Everyone else, immaterial, doesn't matter. And if you look at what he has actually done, no, say it's a Christian type setup. No, it's not. He's redefined Jesus Christ. So we think Jesus Christ, Son of Jehovah, Son of God, Son of uh, the Virgin Mary, he's changed that completely. He's brought in this Michael of Nebadon. Uh, if you believe it is the Archangel Michael, well, that's your choice. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you got his interest in eugenics and with his wife Lena, she had an interest in it as well and about childbirth and things like that so one other woman who had an interest around about the same time and that's Margaret Sanger Margaret Sanger was a hardcore atheist I you know between those three and of that time period you're looking at those who believe they could decide whether you live or die, could decide whether you reproduce, and decide whether you could be born. And the Urantia movement you know, comes from that. You know, I'll just continue on with the last bit and I'll end it here, but this might give you an idea of what Sadler had become. Gooch believes there is a contradiction between Sadler's advocacy of science and reason and his support of the avant-garde theological interplanetary contents of the Urantia book. Gardner describes Sadler's life as riveting and summarises him as an intelligent gifted person who proved to be gullible about alleged supernatural revelations. He contends that Sadler eventually developed megalomania that was unrecognised by those around him 
and argues that Sulla succumbed to hubris and began to believe he was a prophet. Divinely chosen as the founder and leader of a new religion, as someone else called Lewis, disputes this characterization, maintaining that Sulla and those around him sought only to clarify and explain the teachings of the Bible. Yet, he's totally redefined the Bible in the Urantia book. So, I just made this for you to check it out, and I'll put in the Wikipedia page, and other things you can look at. But, the Urantia book seems to be a type of Das Capital for William Sadler. And this is, you know, looking at it now, this is starting to pay off with the things that he believed where, you know, instead of Jesus Christ being the Son of God, it's changed to Jesus Christ is God and now Jesus Christ is some sort of tofu smoking pufta and maybe this is what Sadler intended. <laughs>